sorry am i audible yes so yes, this Mr. vision yes. so this vision of atmanirbhar bharat in electronics and semiconductors was given further momentum with the approval of the semicon india program for the development of semiconductor and display manufacturing ecosystem by government of india the program aims to provide financial support to companies investing in semiconductors display manufacturing and design ecosystem this will serve to pave the way for india's growing presence in the global electronic value chain there are many schemes introduced under the program which the speakers today will be dwelling upon friends there are a whole range of reasons why india is one of the most interesting destinations today for foreign investment let me now say a few lines on how we from our embassy could support you in your investment journey in india with the help of our make in india metal strand program the program is in a way india's red carpet for german metal strand the program is run on behalf of our embassy by rodin partner supported by a network of competing partners such as tax and legal partners which include rodin partner themselves and kaitan and co the then we have the indo german chamber of commerce as a partner chamber the deutsche bank the kfw dg and the state bank of india as financial partners the global innovation and technology alliance of cii as a technology partner and many state governments in india the program partners offer sub expert services in the fields of investment consulting tax and legal financial services and project financing for market entry expansion feasibility studies etc the program also provides free of cost benefits by way of special workshops networking information exchange etc invest india which is the official government agency for investment promotion along with nine indian state governments are also program partners who assist companies with regulations and permission issues to facilitate their investment the program has scheduled a range of webinars on topics relevant to german metal strand companies friends the program is currently on its seventh year achieving 151 onboarded metal strand member companies and facilitating a declared investment of about euro 1.46 billion i take this opportunity to once again welcome german metal strand companies to take advantage of the services provided under this program for their planned investment or expansion in the country i wish you all interesting and fruitful discussions thank you back to you ms karina yeah thank you mr vitel that was very uh, nice and a very kind address from you uh, we'll now move on to our first speaker for today uh, hemant patel uh so hemant works with rodland partner he is a senior professional with over 11 years of experience hemant is a qualified ca and a cfa charter holder uh he has experience in advisory consulting and has managed uh, and closed multiple buy side and sell side m&a deals his domain expertise pertains to the areas of financial due diligence and valuation advisory for cross border and domestic merger and acquisition transactions Today Hemant is going to give us an overview of the fundamental macroeconomic outlook of the Indian economy. Over to you Hemant. Thank you Karan. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen as you think it's working. Uh is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh so um thank you Karan and uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction and uh, now today uh, you know i have chosen the this topic of you know removing the noise and uh, focusing on the big picture right so i mean there are quarters where inflation is a problem there are quarters when uh, you have uh, uh, issues like uh, issues which are short term in nature but what happens over uh, next decade because you as an investor who wants to make, make an entry into india if you want to look at india you want to you don't want to look at a myopic view rather you want to look at what what will happen for next 10 years so so let's talk about that so now you know before i begin you know i i uh, i i started you know i was i was came i came across this article in the economics uh, from may 2022 edition it it nicely captures the 
you know, the reforms that have taken place in last five, in last eight to ten years, and how they position India for you know the next coming decade. And this is this is nicely covered with all the points that can you know uh, the holy trinity that works towards making uh, all the pillars on which the next economic growth will be standing on. So uh, now. We are all expecting that India would be growing at about 7% or 6 to 8% in the range for next 10 years, right? Now, why this is possible? So let's let's deep dive into that. So to, to cutting out the noise and focusing on the fundamental, let's focus on what is happening. Now, this article, I just picked up a snippet from the article. The, a, novel of, a novel confluence of forces stand to transform India's economy, to, economy over the next decade. Now, this is going to be improving the lives of the 1.4 billion people uh, as country emerges out of the pandemic, the growth is visible and this is the kind of growth that has not been seen before. Now, these changes are going to be uh, making India the world's fastest growing big economy in 2022. But what is more important is that India will continue to be the fastest growing big economy for next foreseeable future. At least five to 10 years is what we already think that this is currently in mind. Now, I'm gonna talk about three main pillars on which has made this possible for India to be in a such a strong and comfortable position. Uh, one first is the India's highway network, uh, basically the infrastructure and the communications network that has uh, been built up over the last 10, uh, 10 years. Now, if you, if you see that India's high highway network has doubled in last eight years. Now, this is unheard of in any any economy uh, in such a short span of time. Now, local air traffic has tripled in the same period, and broadband connectivity has risen by 50 times. That that is un, that is totally unimaginable. That would have been unimaginable eight years back, but now it has already happened. To top it up, you know, the, uh, recently PM Modi has announced that there would be a 5G network rollout next month, beginning of next month itself, uh, for at least the uh, major cities in India. Now, this is the one, one pillar which is very important because infrastructure and the connectivity that is, uh, that is built up is the primary pillar or because of which the growth, the economic growth is possible. Businesses can do their business efficiently and cut down on, uh, cut down on the uh, low jams and the costs that would have otherwise been incurred. Now, second is uh, the tax reforms. Now, in 2016, GS, uh, in 2017, GST was introduced. And also, uh, this was one of the, it is unheard of that in any economy, the direct tax and indirect tax are reformed within a span of five years. So that's again a very big uh, contributor in you know formalizing the economy. How the savings which were going in the informal sector, or let's say, in uh, there's a term called this black money in India. Uh, so th that is nothing but an informal economy. That has become formalized now. The savings have been formalized because of the uh, tax reforms that have been undertaken. Further, there was co corporate tax rates that was like that were somewhere around 35 percent were reduced to effective tax of 25 percent. Now this also made it, you know, uh, and in spite of reduction in tax rates, the current tax collection for for the government or tax to GDP ratio is at a record high in the entire uh, history of India's economic policies. Now, we've already reached around 12% of uh, direct tax collections uh, as a percentage of GDP. And this, uh, the effect of increase has not yet slowed down. So what, what is expected is that this would actually reach 15% of GDP, which, which would be a fantastic number in any, from any stretch of imagination. So the, the next, the third point is that, you know, there was the banking system reforms. This is again a very, very important aspect. So now in 2016, uh, from 2000, in the period of last entire year, 10, 10 years, the banking system has become, now uh, has come out of like the worst period to its best and strongest period. So, and 
also in this this period there was an uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code which was also introduced and that also made this possible to an extent but now what we see is that the capitalization of indian banks relative to all the other developed economies or even the emerging economies is one of the best it's at the record high at the present level now these are all the strong fundamentals which actually points towards nothing but a uh, the strongest economic growth that can be foreseen for the next decade now another aspect i would you know uh, uh, put focus on is the uh, the jandal account the aadhar bank and the mobile or all as it call as jan this is this this i would call as a holy trinity of uh, social network automated social network that indian government has implemented in a successful way you know and this has helped india to government to actually roll out a lot of policies that they wanted to much efficiently and quickly so even management of covid vaccination or even your highway tolls that is all driven because there is an existing system of aadhar uh, aadhar card mobile phone and jandana bank account which are linked interlinked with each other uh, so i will dwell upon each of these topics and that is what we are uh, discussing for today's uh, um, uh, uh, for today's uh, webinar and this basically is the defining moment that this is uh, this is going to be the india's moment after a decade of fundamental reforms so the pain of reforms have been uh, already been uh, uh, you know dues have been paid and now is the time to reap the benefits and harvest what are the uh, what the benefits will be out of these reforms over the next day uh, now let's look at the first aspect the transportation and the communication network now india's highway network has doubled in the past decade from 67000 kilometers uh, 67000 kilometers to 138000 kilometers of highway and even at present the uh, the rate at which the construction has been taken uh, on a daily basis uh, is uh, is you know is astounding i would say for example in 2021 the record achieved was 37 kilometers of construction of highways per day now that's the average they got in fy21 and for 23 they have set an even ambitious target of doing 40 kilometers of highway construction per day now there are these are all strategic the industrial corridors that they have focused on uh, as a government policy to you know make it possible for every uh, industrial corridor to have connectivity with the ports and connectivity with all the markets important markets so delhi bombay uh, delhi calcutta delhi Ch uh, kolkata chennai uh, and several other important corridors that's where the focus has been for uh, development of the infrastructure road infrastructure now uh, similarly air passenger traffic this is again an important indicator the air passenger traffic in the country has increased three folds so from a mere 54 million in 2019 to 168 million in 2019 now also what has happened is the airports even for the mid tier and the smaller cities have become operational and you know uh, that has increased the connectivity uh, between all the between all the cities major cities as well as the smaller cities now you know uh, while back you know our parents used to talk about a uh, travel uh, between the cities sometimes used to take 24 hours 28 hours uh, by one way or the other but in our generation and the future generations if we talk about the travel of anything more than 10 hours they they would they would basically find it unbelievable in any so that is the development within the last decade that has happened that connectivity has increased to uh, an exorbitant level uh, now now we have now, now look, let's look at the bank account penetration uh, from 35% of the uh, uh, indians holding the bank accounts uh, just a decade ago today there is 80% of indians who have access to bank account now this is a phenomenal achievement if you imagine that you know the size of population the size at which the economy uh, is presently and 80% penetration is unthinkable unheard of sort of a situation and also what has happened in uh, 2016 the aadhar card was linked with the upi so the uh, now upi is the world's 
largest real time payment interface now it facilitates peer to peer and peer to merchant transactions and the if the figures at which they have this upi has operated they are astounding like from mere 1 billion dollar in fy 16 17 today the uh, transactions have sure have moved beyond 560 60 billion dollars and also this is like government is also introducing its own uh, app which is free of cost uh, like called as behind upi and they have now accounted for 15% of gdp the upi transaction themselves so this the digitalization of payments is it's contributing in a big way of form, uh, of formalization of savings so all the savings which were going which were in the informal sector have come into formal sector so this will definitely be the uh, big contributor in uh, stable economy as well as the growth of the financial sector uh now the third is the internet usage now this is also an important parameter because uh, the proportion of uh, proportion of indian population which was using internet was merely 8% in 2010 and now it is 43% and the data consumption is the highest in the world in india at the same time the indian consumer enjoys the lowest per uh, gb let's say internet cost when in the using the services so moving on to the now and now the right now in the present scenario there is no parallel to understand these reforms if i if i compare it to any other uh, any other country in the world but what i found is if you really want to go back and you know look at comparable model just a mental model if you want to create it resembles what america the american century what america was from 1880 uh, to 18 uh, 1930 the 50 years which it took to you know reach developed uh, nation status so that reforms india has already undertaken within last 10 years so now if you if you think about it so from uh, in 1880s america at 1870 america was pretty much a village economy right so you had your local shops in the uh you had your local farmers who would make their produce in 88 1880 the first major uh, infrastructure development they did was railroads then came telegraph which was the connect, uh, which was the communications part in 1900 and then come then came the uh, uh, manufacture of automobiles the ford model t was the first commercial produ- produced automobile in 1908 and in by 1940 they had completed the road and railway network uh, covering the entire country and this led america to an expansive growth phase from 1940 to uh, you know even to until recent past they enjoyed an extensive growth because of this uh, you know, groundwork which was done in these 50 years so if we have to draw parallel india is going through the same identical phase of development a network economy is driving the emergence of large companies and domestic uh, and dominating industries so what we have seen in uh, us it's very much likely we would see the same kind of results in india moving on uh, the next pillar we can talk about is the tax reforms now gst was one of the most important uh, i would say the tax reform that was undertaken now what happened with gst is you know it became very difficult to avoid tax now how gst system has been derived is you know if if for example i am a service provider and if i have to take credit for my input goods or input services then i need to make that declaration right and then that means that means that my suppliers have been uh, have been reported in my uh, gst returns similarly as the chain goes down the cascading effect every layer gets report it reports their output as well as their input credits uh, input uh, supplies so that that is where it is becoming more and more difficult for uh, for any business to do their the informal businesses to continue with their ways of the past Uh, of avoiding taxes because the infrastructure and technology used in the infrastructure is designed in the such a sophisticated manner that uh, 
all the economy is getting formalized. Now, I've, I've taken a small example here of plastics and pipes market share company, right? So, in, in let's say in 2010, the organized and un unorganized sec uh, part of the pipes and plastic industry was uh, was around 50-50. Now, today, this number has drastically reduced. Uh, one second. Yes, slide is showing him and you can continue. Yeah. And so now, so this is this is the major impact we see during because of GST. The imp implications have been far down in every sec every sector of the economy. Now the next is the income tax regime. Now in in September 2019, uh, the tax rate was reduced from effective tax rate of around 35 percent for corporates to around 22 percent. Now what what happened was the because of this tax. Uh, reduction in taxes, the actual tax collection today has gone sky high. It is at the record highest levels. I mean, you can see in the table uh, on the top that we have we are just going one way direction, except for a small blip in COVID. That this the, the number of tax collection has is going up and at a healthy rate. Also, what is happening is more and more people are getting under the tax ambit. Because it is because because of the like the points we discussed earlier, formalization of savings, uh, basically the black money or the unorganized sector is reducing and thereby our tax collection has been keep on has been kept, kept on going up. Now what this, this has multiple effects, but the primary one thing that we see is now the government, even by providing a lower tax rate, gets some more revenue. That means government has more funds. Uh, at their disposal for taking on further infrastructure uh, development. So this is like a, the cycle which is feeding itself. You do more infrastructure development, more tax collected, and again, you have more funds for making uh, further uh, development in the same area. So now moving to the, the third important element. Uh, the, because see, a lifeblood for any economic growth is its financial sector. So the between, I mean, I'll take you back uh, just to uh, 2011 to 2014, 2015 period when banking system was in actually serious troubles. Now, now three important things happened after that. Now, in 2015, uh, the then RBI governor, uh, Mr. Raghuram Raj, Rajan, he held a meeting in Bombay with all the bankers, the ND CEOs of all the banks, and he said that, you know, you have three months' time clean up your books and report the actual uh, actual balance sheets or actual uh, uh, make provision for actual NPAs that you have on your books. Now, now this was the crazy, crazy period, you know, because the bankers made, obviously made a lot of calls to Delhi. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just involved in a bit of politics into it, but uh, that's, that's relevant. Politics and economics go actually hand in hand. Uh, so now, so a lot of bankers made a phone calls to New Delhi, uh, saying that, guys, this is going. Uh, this we will be you know, in serious trouble if we actually do this asset quality review and clean up our books within this time. And please help us. But what New Delhi did was New Delhi said no, uh, and it did. It rather made it uh, as a policy that all the banks have to do the asset quality review and make the appropriate provision for their stressed assets. And to further enable them in cleaning up their books, in 2016, the insolvency and bankruptcy code was also promulgated. Now, see, because of all these uh, reforms and uh, changes that were brought in, uh, so many prom uh, prominent crony capitalists, uh, you know, who rooted the banking system for so long, I mean, they, they would, I mean, I would actually have, uh, you know, made bets with my friends that, you know, these are all talks, nothing would actually happen to such a big person. But now we see in the real life that they, these big industrialists and big crony capitalists actually lost control of their firm in the bankruptcy process. So that is what the actual effect was put in on the ground. And so and, and further that after when the, once the cleanup was done, government actually deplaced a lot of public sector banks and which made them and the merged the smaller banks into into bigger banks to make them fewer and financially strong banks. 
So now if you see the charge on the stressed assets, uh, this drastically, today the, what has happened is the stressed assets have gone down. So basically quality of assets have gone up and our capital adequacy ratio has, is at the record highest level. If this capital adequacy ratio is higher than any other uh, uh, developed economy that I can, I can pick it up and I can compare. It's not ever, this is like sort of a world record at which we are at. Uh, in terms of the uh, quality of assets and capital education ratio. So now this basically is the lifeblood for any future their economic group. And this part has been taken care of by the pains in last four or five years. Uh, so now just to summarize everything that we discussed. So three things which uh, which have which were three important pillars which were you know worked up which were worked by the uh, government over the last decade one was the tax reforms and the crackdown on the tax evasion uh, the banking systems clean up and the second and the third is the infrastructure and communications network so now these all three are together working with each other all three uh, reforms are working with each other and we are seeing the results so the FDI inflows that are coming into India are, are going all over, only in one direction and it still continues to grow up. So now these are all FDIs which have come in, in this period. The results of this onto actual economic growth will come in the next five, 10 years. So now recently India, from, from 10th largest economy in 2010, uh, India recently became fifth largest economy overtaking uh, UK recently, right? So now the next goal that is, set up by the government is to become uh, a five trillion dollar economy. This now looks more and more a question of when rather than if. And the second goal of becoming third largest economy of by 2032 also looks pretty much achievable within this time. Uh, so now with this, I will, you know, uh, end my um, presentation. I hope I stuck to the timelines and did not exceed it. Yes. Over to you, Karana. Hemant, you were great. Thank you so much for your insightful thoughts and deep analysis on this Indian market scenario. Uh, I'd like to now uh, welcome Laksh. Uh, Laksh is a part of the ESCM team at Invest India, the National Investment Promotion and Facilitation Agency. Um, he has been instrumental in building the Indian investment pipeline uh, along with conceptualizing incentive policies and structural reforms for the electronics and semiconductor sector. Laksh has a background in chemical engineering and has received his undergraduate at Bitspilani. Laksh has over two years of experience at Invest India. Laksh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Karuna. Okay. So, okay. So, um, at the onset, as uh, I just want to thank Rodel and Cotton for organizing this webinar uh, and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, today, uh, I'm uh, Laksh, I'm a part of the electronic team at Invest India. Uh, I'll, today, I'll uh, speak uh, building on what Hammond suggested uh, in his uh, presentation about the strengths uh, of the Indian economy and I'll venture to the specific part uh, of the semiconductor industry in India and the recently launched Semicon India program. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'll welcome all our guests uh, from uh, Germany and India who join us today. And uh, with that, I'll uh, go to my presentation. I'll start with my presentation. So uh, recently, uh, in December uh, 2021, Government of India launched $10 billion Semicon India program to establish India as semi uh, global hub for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, the idea behind uh, the Semicon India program was built on the recent successes in the electronics manufacturing in the PLI scheme for mobile phones and the IT hardware. And the fundamental uh, factors driving these policy making has been highlighted by the Honorable Prime Minister of India in his recent address uh, at the World Economic Forum and Semicon India con uh, conference where he has highlighted that these policies are not uh, built, formulated, uh, with a vision of five to six years, but a vision of 20 to 25 years, where India will become a reliable partner for all the global supply chain and will be well integrated in the tech manufacturing uh, for uh, global, uh, for the globe. 
So I'll briefly touch on the Indian economy. Uh, today we are an economy of about uh, today we are an economy of about three trillion dollars. We aim to reach about an economy of about nine trillion dollars uh, by 2030. Uh, the fundamental nature of our economy has changed uh, recently uh, with the adoption of the Digital India program, and which is shown in the amount of uh, adoption of the internet services, 5G subscription. And the uh, and the uh, digitization of our financial technology system. Uh, in this period, uh, India has attracted a lot of uh, cumulative uh, MPI in India, with the cumulative MPI reaching to the tune of eight twenty five billion dollars by twenty twenty one. So, uh, just to highlight again on the. Uh, transformations that have been happening uh, in the Indian economy. Today, uh, we have about 1.2 billion uh, mobile subscribers in, in India and 700 million uh, internet sub users in India. 500 million uh, 5G subscriptions would be there by 2027. And as uh, Hemant highlighted in his presentation on the Jam Trinity, which has digitized our economy a lot. What essentially has happened uh, with the digitization efforts of government of India is that there is a tremendous demand for the semiconductor products in the Indian economy. Uh, so uh, now I'll focus more on the electronic to start with a give a context uh, of uh, electronics manufacturing. Uh, today we are about a $120 billion electronics manufacturing market uh, out of which $76 billion is the domestic manufacturing. Uh, we aim to reach about $300 billion by 2020. Uh, 26. Uh, the two key drivers of the market have been the mobile phone manufacturing and the IP hardware manufacturing, both of which for which uh, we have uh, dedicated PLIs. Uh, in the mobile phones, we aim to reach from $30 billion to $126 billion of uh, manufacturing. And for the IP hardware, which includes laptops, tablets, we aim to reach from $3 billion to $25 billion. So all in all, there will be a tremendous growth in the domestic manufacturing for electronics, uh, which will grow to the tune of almost 30 percent. So uh, now I'll focus more, uh, narrow it down to the semiconductor market opportunity in India. Today, semiconductor opportunity in India stands around $15 billion, and it will reach uh, to the tune of $110 billion by 2030. Uh, in this uh, memory market would account for about 40 billion dollars by 2030 which would be almost roughly equally uh, divided among NAND flash mem memories and the key segment for this uh, would be uh, autos evs uh, and uh, um, mobiles uh, and will, there will also be focus on power semiconductors uh, and uh, telecommunication sector. Uh, again, uh, again, so narrow. Can you hear me? Yes, oh. Lakshya, we can. Yeah. Sure. So uh, narrowing down on the manufacturing opportunity in the manufacturing supply chain, the there are opportunity in India would be around 85 to 100 billion dollars for the manufacturing supply chain by 2030, which will include about 30 to 35 billion dollars for the equipment manufacturing, about 15 to 18 billion dollars for the materials manufacturing, 5 uh, uh, billion dollar man uh, market opportunity for services. Uh, now I'll go over the incentive program offered by the government of India. Uh, this would include about uh, $30 billion of fiscal support for to make India global hub for electronics manufacturing. This would include $10 billion of the Semicon India program, $7 billion for the electronic manufacturing, which includes PLI for mobile and $13 billion of the PLI support for uh, uh, allied sectors. Uh, to go specific to the Semicon India program, the $10 billion program would include uh, semicon uh, focus on semicon and display fabrication, compound semiconductors and packaging. Uh, 
dedicated program for semiconductor design and transformation of India's strategic fab SPL. Uh, we also created a dedicated institution called India Semiconductor. And now specific coming specific to the incentive program, the incentive would be to the tune of 50% uh, of the project cost for setting up semiconductor fabs in India. The, the, with the recent amendment, there would be the incentive would be uniform for all technology nodes. Uh, and the incentive tenure, the policy tenure is for about six years. Uh, for the display fab, uh, the incentive is again to the tune of 50% of the project cost and it would uh, be equal for all the technologies. Uh, again, the uh, uh, policy tenure is for six years. The incentive is on the project cost and not just on the capital expenditure. For semiconductor packaging and compound semiconductors, the fiscal support would be 50% of the capital expenditure. With the recent amendment, we have increased it uh, from uh, reimbursement basis to pari basso basis. Just to add on that, the state incentives would be over and above. It will reach about uh, additional 20%. So all in all, 70% of the uh, capex would be uh, uh, as provided as incentive for uh, OSAT and compound in and other. Just to go, give you overview of the ecosystem in India, the domestic value chain accounts for about, uh, we have a nascent domestic value chain in India built on the strategic facilities in India. We have uh, DRDO labs for the fabrication, uh, which also takes sitar, uh, discrete manufacturing in CDIL and some sort of packaging in spell uh, in uh, SPL, uh, SPL, SPL, and TITSOL. For the equipment, we, India has a presence of all uh, made global MNCs and also EDA tools. In the design side, uh, India is home to almost all major uh, fabulous players in India with the de major design centers in India. At the same time, we also have fabulous companies like Sanja Lab, Signal, Steridian, and Cyril to give a highlight of the uh, supply chain in India for fab consumables, especially specialty gases and chemicals, uh, we have a very vibrant chemical ecosystem and India is all, the third largest producer for sulfuric acid, fourth largest producer of ammonia. And uh, all these chemicals are, are currently manufactured in India and as and when the manufacturing facility comes in, there will be upgradation to supply it to the semiconductor grade. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, we also have uh, uh, also deployed uh, fabricated chips uh, in the Chandrayaan program and Gaganyaan program, uh, the Na Navic program, for, which is the indigenous GPS ecosystem uh, GPS uh, system in India, uh, is fabricated in SPL. So India has shown capability in designing and fabricating of the semiconductor chip. Uh, we have a nascent ecosystem where the strategic uh, programs like SITAR, Gator, SENSE uh, are, are act as an established partner uh, for collaborative innovation for the upcoming FAB. Uh, the pro, uh, the skill inst engineering institutes in India like IITs, IIITs, NITs provide a uh, ready supply of skills uh, for the semiconductor manufacturing in India. Uh, on top of it, Government of India runs program for SMDP and Electronic Sector Skill Council. Uh, we also have state-of-the-art nano fabrication facilities, seven facilities across India, uh, which is spread uh, in the academic key institutions of India, and that would help uh, for the innovating technology as uh, technology obsolescence risk is very uh, uh, con is a very much a concern in the semiconductor industry. Uh, just uh, coming on specific to the end on the semiconductor strong design presence in the semiconductor industry with almost about 20,000 semiconductor design engineers. Uh, we have about 2,000 chips designed in India with specific programs like Shakti, Vega, uh, a homegrown program for chip design in India. Uh, just coming to the end of my presentation, uh, the vibrant startup ecosystem in India provides ancillary ecosystem ancillary services uh, to the semiconductor fabs and facilities it's been an unforgettable year for tech startups in India with 42 tech startups turning unicorn in last year. Uh, additionally, 
uh, there have been huge growth uh, for the startups in the uh, services testing and prototyping and design uh, in the chip industry. So, and the startup ecosystem are the drivers of innovation in Indian ecosystem. Uh, just at the last, uh, I would highlight the ease of doing business initiatives taken by government of land bank system under which 4,500 industrial parks have been mapped uh, to cover area of about 5 lakh hectares, bonded manufacturing for zero rated import of inputs and public procurement to give demand aggregation support uh, to the manufacturers in India and a dedicated national single window ecosystem uh, to provide regulatory support uh, for uh, investors in India. So, uh, Final word from uh, Invest India, and uh, thank you for your time and patience for the presentations. Uh, Invest India is the national uh, investment promotion agency, and we are here to support you in your investment journey in India. Thank you so much. Uh, I can take any questions if there are. Thank you, Laksh. That was very informative. Uh, yes, we do have uh, questions. And on that note, I'll move on to the last part of our uh, session today, which is the Q&A session. Uh, I'll begin first with uh, Heman since uh, he had uh, taken the presentation first. So, Heman, um, are you, can you please switch on your camera? Heman, yes. Okay, uh, Heman, we have a we have a question for you. You have spoken about the reforms that have uh, you know taken place in India. According to you, uh, where do you think is the shortcoming which is curbing the growth of the economy? Uh, as we have covered, I mean, uh, when I have spoken about the fundamental reforms that have taken place, but you know, as the reforms are like a it's an ongoing process. It doesn't happen all at once. Although a lot of things have been achieved. Uh, if I have to right. pick something that you know, still needs further uh, reforms in at least, at least for India, I would say that would be the judicial reforms, which are still, I mean, there has been improvement to an extent, but I think there is still a long way to go on that. Uh, so if I have to pick one, I would say judicial reforms is something still a long way to go. I definitely agree with you on that one. It's well noted. Thank you. Uh, Laksha, we have um, a couple of questions for you as well. Um, Laksh, uh, the first question that I want to uh, throw at you is that what is the current status of the Semicon India program? Where do you think it stands today? Um, thank you, uh, Karna, for the question. Uh, so broadly, uh, with the first round of application closed on 15 February 2022, uh, we received five applications, uh, which includes three for the semiconductor fabs and two for the display fabs. Uh, we received yeah. some in the semiconductor OSAT and uh, about 14 applications in the semiconductor design. Uh, since then, Government of India has been in the uh, regular consultation with the industry and based on those consultation, uh, last week uh, we revised our program. Uh, and as I highlighted again in my presentation that the uh, incentives have been increased. 50% uh, of incentives have been made for across the technology nodes and the uh, for the compound semiconductors and OSATs, the incentive has been increased from 30 to 50 percent, and the mode of disbursement has also been made pari So, so uh, we are again in the market. Uh, we want to hear more from the industry, and uh, we 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 look forward for more interest in the semicon program. I think those are really good moves uh, from your end. Um, another question that we have for you is, uh, which market segment will have a unique advantage for investors in India, considering what you mentioned? Sure. Uh, so uh, as I highlighted in my presentation, uh, from the electronics manufacturing point of view, the mobile manufacturing and the IT hardware manufacturing has really picked up in India. Uh, with the uh, large scale manufacturing for the mobile phones and IT hardware, the demand for the semiconductor chips uh, for in communication and the mobile computing uh, would increase. Additionally, given our well-developed uh, automotive ecosystem in India, the automotive chips uh, and their manufacturing would also be uh, very great. Um, and based on our analysis, uh, given uh, the power semiconductor ecosystem uh, and the, its potential in India, uh, I think we are very optimistic on power semiconductors. 
Okay, great. Uh, Laksh, last question we have uh, for you is that uh, for German investors, how would you describe uh, a strategic partnership model for entry in the Indian ecosystem for the investors? Sure. So uh, broadly, uh, we from Invest India perspective, we have seen uh, investors coming looking at India in two ways. One is the direct entry where the manufacturers, especially uh, in the West, has been very keen on uh, setting up manufacturing facilities and going into India completely on their own, uh, and okay. especially with US investors. Uh, while on the east side of India, we have seen, uh, especially with the Taiwanese investors, that uh, they prefer more uh, strategic partnership mode, uh, under which right. uh, they collaborate with the Indian partner who has uh, understanding of the ground, who has been in the Indian ecosystem, and with that partnership, uh, the manufacturing grows for uh, both both the companies. Uh, I okay. think. Uh, we have been uh, very uh, interested to look in the technology development in Germany, especially in Fraunhofer Institute and uh, German companies like Infineon, uh, and uh, we are in regular touch with them. I think it depends on case to case, but uh, uh, given that electronics manufacturing aspect that uh, Indian companies are well established to partner with the German companies uh, to set up manufacturing. Okay. Thank you, Laksha. All your answers were really informative. Uh, with those answers, I'd like to uh, call it the end of today's session. Uh, we would like to thank the Embassy of India Berlin and Invest India for all the support and a special thank to both our speakers, Heyman from Rutland Partner and Laksh from Invest India. Uh, we would like to keep you informed that we will be conducting uh, such sessions uh, very often on a regular basis and we will keep you updated on our next webinar shortly. You may keep uh, you know, finding us available with webinars on our LinkedIn page. Uh, so stay tuned and until then, stay safe, stay healthy. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Karna.